Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Sperian Educational Webinar Series. We're here to provide opportunities for carriers to advance their education through collaboration with the industry and technical experts. My name is Ronnie Taylor. I'm Vice President of Industry Relations for Sperian. And we're here today to really give you some great information about FISMA. Um, we have a great group of experts. And today we're going to really help you understand everything from A to Z about FISMA. We want to leave here today's presentation with a good understanding of the new regulations. And to that end, we encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation. And at the end, we'll come back and answer all of your questions. So let me get started with the introduction. Today we have John Sampson, the Executive Director of the Agriculture and Food Transporters Conference for the American Trucking Association. John joined AFTA and ATA in October of 2011. The AFTC is a national organization representing motor carriers and allied members of the American Trucking Association on critical issues affecting agricultural commodities and food transportation. It was founded in 1995, and their mission is to increase safety, security, profitability, and efficiency of transporters of agricultural commodities, food, forest products, and natural resources. After works to ensure that its members operate in a strong and profitable business environment by helping shape legislation and regulations that impact the agriculture and food transportation industry. Before moving to Washington, D.C., John grew up in a, on a family hog farm in southwest Montana. The farm kept him busy on his off days during high school and through college at Montana State University. He also holds a master's degree in public policy from George Mason University and resides in Fairfax, Virginia with his wife, his daughter, and his son. So welcome, John. Now, we also have with us today um, Kevin Boydstrom of Sharp Transportation. Kevin is a veteran of the transportation industry since 1992, having begun as a driver and then moving through operations, dispatch, planning, and customer service. Since Kevin's tenure with Sharp Transportation began 15 years ago, he's been the organist, he's seen the organization grow from a 40 truck operation to a 91 truck operation with approximately 195 trailers. Sharp runs both dry vans and refrigerated trailers and serves the lower 48 states with both asset and brokerage capabilities. With offices in Utah and Idaho, a refrigerated and dry warehouse in Utah, and the cartage company Western Logistics in Sumner, Washington. Sharp is an early adopter of transportation and logistics technology and strategies that improve their efficiency. Thanks to both John and Kevin for joining us today. Now let me turn it over to John to, to get us started. Okay, John. Thanks, Ronnie. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is John Sampson. I'm with the American Trucking Associations. And before I dive a little bit further into uh, FISMA, I just want to give you a little bit of background of exactly where it came from. Uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act passed in 2011 was in response to uh, listeria outbreaks, salmonella outbreaks, uh, mainly stemming from the manufacturing, the processing, and the handling of food. And within FISMA, there are seven major sections. And one of those sections is the sanitary transportation of human and animal food. And this was uh, based on a 2005 sanitary transport rule that was passed, but never uh, really moved forward as far as requirements goes. And so this was Congress's way of adding it back into FISMA and stating that we really want to see a full uh, regulation from farm to fork. And in order to do that, we've got to be able to, to look at transportation and be able to focus on transportation as, as well. At the end of the day, we were fairly satisfied with the way that FDA crafted the rule, uh, really basing it on a lot of the current practices, current best industry practices that are out there today. And so I plan to go through and to give you the highlights of what is encompassed in the rule. And then I think Kevin's going to do a fantastic job of really getting more down into the weeds, showing exactly what impacts he plans to have uh, it from a business perspective. And so with that, 
Next slide, please. The objective of the rule is really to prevent food from becoming unsafe. And this is a little bit of a departure from the initial proposal. They were looking at more about uh, the potential of uh, microorganisms, the potential of adulteration, and they really paired that back to a uh, direct focus of preventing food from becoming unsafe. And the three ways they go about uh, wanting to, to accomplish that are to ensure that the food is properly refrigerated uh, and making sure that the vehicles and the equipment are properly cleaned and sanitized and then ensuring that the food is properly protected during transport. We'll kind of run through the details of each one of those as we go along here. The rule really establishes requirements, which, as you'll see as we, as we go through these, a lot of these requirements are already established. They just put this more uh, in, in, in their regulations and their requirements, uh, but it is really based on those best practices. It establishes those requirements for the shippers, the carriers by uh, motor and rail vehicle, so mainly just ground domestic transportation, and then uh, loaders and receivers of those that are transporting the food product. Uh, and FDA really looked at water and air, but they felt it was kind of out of their purview in order to go and actually regulate those water and, and, and air transportation arms. And so they really just focused on the domestic ground transportation of the food industry. Again, this was based on the two, 2005 Act uh, that really started to take a much more focused look at those that are transporting food. But they also, again, and we'll keep coming back to this, and you'll be able to see because of the vagueness, the ambiguity in the rule, how they really are focused on those best industry practices. The topics that they're looking at include uh, the actual equipment, the vehicles, the transportation, the refrigeration units, the pallets, everything that goes into the transporting of the product, the transportation operations, everything outside of the equipment that goes into the moving of the products, and then training of employees and then record keeping of both that training and the different operations that are currently ongoing as well as a waiver process that they put in place. There are two waivers right now, one being the uh, movement of grade A milk and they decided to waive that process through this FDA requirement because the process that grade A milk has in place right now far exceeds what FDA does and then those deliveries from a restaurant or a grocery store direct to the consumer. And so they have a process in place where additional uh, products or processes could get waived, but those are the two that they have started with. It does not address food security. They understand that there is some sort of correlation between security and safety, but they believe that that was out of the scope of the food safety rule and that they were going to address that later. And then uh, we won't get too much into these, but the proposed rule had several areas of concern. Uh, it was uh, FDA, we met with them probably uh, a at least a dozen times with everybody within the supply chain. And they verbally committed to keeping this thing flexible, uh, really understanding the processes that are out there in the industry. But when they in initially proposed the, the rule, it didn't quite match up with that. And so by the time we got to the final rule, we were mostly satisfied with what they uh, were able to write. Who's covered under, uh, under the new rules? Uh, shippers, carriers, loaders, receivers. Uh, looking at the definition, one of the big changes that was made was the definition of a shipper. It's now a person who arranges for the transportation of the food, which now includes potentially the manufacturer, and definitely anybody that's brokering out loads for the shipper. A carrier, of course, is the person that actually physically moves the product. A loader was, again, another addition to the definitions, meaning that it's the person that actually loads the product onto uh, the trailer or the rail car. And the reason they included the loader, uh, for example, at the cross dock facility, if you have the shipping company and they load the truck, they have all the requirements, the truck gets to the cross dock facility, half of their product is unloaded, and then another shipper's product is loaded onto that trailer. The loader is now responsible for a lot of the requirements, making sure the trailer's clean, making sure the unit's working properly. And they did that to take the liability off the initial shipper because 
now that he's already done went through the process, he doesn't understand the new products that have been placed onto that trailer. And so that is the reason for the addition of the loader. And then, of course, uh, the receiver, the, any person who receives the food at, a, at, at any point in the U.S. after transportation. And then who is not covered? Uh, very small businesses. These are less than $500,000 in annual revenue. This was kind of interesting because in the preamble, they stated a couple studies of why they chose to do uh, to write these rules. And they pointed out that there were some instances of foodborne related illness as it related to transportation, but it was actually these smaller box truck guys, which are now exempted from the rule, which we thought was interesting, but they did want to have some sort of small business carve out. Uh, those that are engaged in food transshipped through the US, so produce from Mexico moving all the way up to Canada, as long as we're not consuming it as, as, uh, as United States citizens then, or with, domestically, then it's not going to fall under the rule. However, if you are manufacturing product within the U.S. and you're sending it to export, you actually fall underneath that rule until it gets to the barge or the plane or wherever, however it's, it's leaving the country. And so that was another fairly large change that was made. Food located in a facility that's already regulated by USDA. So you have F the Food Safety Inspection Service that currently oversees uh, meat products, poultry, and eggs. And so as long as it's underneath USDA's pur purview, it does not fit underneath FDA. And then farms performing all the transportation operations uh, within uh, the FDA requirements are actually exempted from this as well. The food that's not covered, another big change. The initial exemption for food was completely enclosed in a container that was shelf stable. Now it's completely enclosed in a container that is not requiring temperature control for safety. And so for an example, that exempts all frozen food products. Because if a carrier gets to a receiver and they take a look at the product and it's supposed to be frozen and it no longer is frozen, then they're going to reject it on quality before it even gets to the, to the safety concern. And uh, so that was, that was the reasoning behind that. Uh, compressed food gases, uh, human food byproducts that are transported for animal feed, uh, directly for animal feed. This does not include ethanol. Uh, it's something that we're working on, but right now it's just human food byproducts. And then uh, live animals as well. Looking at the vehicles and, and, and the equipment, uh, some of the requirements, as you'll see in most of these, is very common sense stuff that's already uh, taking place in the industry, that it must be designed and made from material that can be adequately clean and sanitized. One of the concerns we have is there's no uh, specifics or definition for adequately clean and sanitized. So as many of these requirements are, the discretion is up to the shipper to make that determination and then that product must be maintained in sanitary condition where the food will not become unsafe. And so you look here, you see the broken pallet. Is that something that could potentially puncture the product? And so within that contract is broken pallets, uh, are, are they not allowed uh, within the trailer? And so certain specifics like that, again, are worked out by the, uh, by, through the shipping contract, but can be uh, a part of that. Again, it's got to be stored in a manner to prevent pests or contamination. Uh, you don't want it in, uh, uh, outside in, in, in the field with a couple holes in the roof because of the elements that are able to get in there. And also uh, for TCS, uh, temperature control for safety, the equipment has to be designed. Again, this is a very basic and, and, uh, and straightforward. Maintain and equip to provide proper temperature control. So you're refrigeration unit has to be uh, working properly. Uh, anything as far as seals and everything else have to be designed and, and working properly as well. The transfer, the, the transportation operations portion of it, uh, these have to be uh, conducted under appropriate conditions. Uh, looking at cross-contamination, you have to make sure that there's no way that food items can be contaminated with non-food items. You have to make sure you have proper isolation for bulk vehicles, especially if you're concerned with any sort of allergens. And then you also have to ensure that TCS food is transported at the correct temperature. Uh, 
that temperature again set forth by the shipper. And then the type of food, and this is another uh, change, large change that FDA made showing us that their initial thought process of everything fits in one box, one size fits all approach, uh, wasn't the best way to go about things. And now they understand that depending on what type of food it is and where it's at in its production process, there's going to be different requirements in order to properly handle that product. And then uh, rounding things out with training and record keeping. Uh, training, there's a very basic minimum training requirement that FDA ended up with. They're going to provide a online course that you can go on, take one hour of online training. Uh, it's going to be the kind of the basics of food safety, handling the product, what's in this sanitary transport rule, and then it'll provide a certificate with the date and the name of the person, and that would be sufficient for meeting that minimum training requirement, and it would also be sufficient for the record keeping of that training. Now, that doesn't preclude anyone from doing your own training. It doesn't preclude you from going out and getting third-party training. They just wanted to have a, a free online module for people to go and to, to, to be able to meet that training requirement. And then uh, record keeping, again, this is uh, a big change from the initial uh, rule. <coughs> Initially, we were concerned that it was going to be a, a, a room full of records type of request for carriers. Uh, but the change that FDA made is the only thing they want to see as far as records goes is the ability and the process and the procedures in order uh, to be able to show in order to uh, whether they need to go retrieve temperature records whether they need to show if person A has been trained, uh, if they need to be able to show uh, if there is a problem with temperatures to be able to go back and retrieve those. And so they just want to see, and it goes for cleaning and sanitizing as well, the process that you go through to do that, not records for every single trailer, for every single load for the past 12 months, just the process that's in place. And they also eliminated the three previous loads requirement, which we felt that if the shipper wants to see three previous loads, if there's an allergen that is going to be transported before another product, maybe you'd like to see that. But if you're running barley out of a field 20, 25 times in a day, the three previous loads probably doesn't make a lot of sense. So again, that's up to the, the discretion of the shipper and, and what they're uh, asking them to transport. And with that, uh, and I believe the contact info will be on the last slide as well, but uh, I look forward to your questions. I appreciate everybody participating, and I will send it back over to Ronnie. Great. Thank you so much, John. That was a really good overview. Um, and I just wanted to remind folks to continue to ask your questions. We're getting a lot of great questions. And John, if I can just toss one out to you right now before I turn it over to Kevin. Um, and that is, are there any specific regs or rules around the transportation of seafood? This does look at all uh, food and animal products, including seafood. But since uh, the HACCP rules have been in place for so long, they're just like the grade A milk waiver. The requirements for being HACCP certified and being able to follow that process for the seafood industry far and above outweighs anything that FDA is trying to do here. And so if you are HACCP certified or you do follow those rules, then you're going to be far and away ab above the game here as, as we move forward. And so I think that's probably one thing that people need to take into account, especially when, when you're looking at training and, and education on food safety, that that has some certification is probably one of the best things that you could have. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, well, now let's, um, let's move on. And I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Boydston from Sharp Transportation. So Kevin, take it away. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, basically, um, you know, like Ronnie said, I've been in business since about 1992. Uh, started as a driver and kind of worked my way in through, through operations and all capabilities. Um, however, being in the transportation business, I feel more like I'm in the acronym business uh, between EFTA and HOS, CARB, CSA, ELDs. And now we have FISMA. Um, 
the ones that are going to kill you the most are all the ones listed above because they're all going to uh, hit or going to regulate us for the for the next unknown future and and once they're in place they're going to keep on growing uh, next slide what we do here is uh, uh, try to keep our operations educated as far as um, knowing what we're putting on our trucks and how it's going to affect us down the line um, you know customer service we want to know what, what the commodity is what we're going to uh, what we're going to be hauling what's needed to haul that securely and safely and of course you know you, you need to make sure it's going to be something we can we can deal with uh, hazmat anything like that um, the equipment being needed uh, you know, wood, wood floor on our dry vans for securing metal floors on, on the reefers I think we pretty much have got away from wood floors on reefers in the industry on, in the industry um, a lot of stuff we just need to pay attention to on, on uh, when we're keying the order in to get the information to the driver. The driver is the one that's going to be the, the main contact with the customer and making sure everything's followed through. Uh, like John says, we need to kind of look at um, you know your temperatures. Um, you know, will the customer want us to communicate those temperatures during transit? If so, do we have a means of uh, uh, communicating that to the customers? And uh, the cross contaminants, you know, the last three loads. Um, you know, if you're hauling the three loads of barley a day, you don't need it. Uh, other things you do. If you'll kind of notice the pictures off to the side, um, this was an actual load that we did. Um, we picked up a load of bark in Gillette, Wyoming, back in uh, July of last year. You can see where that trailer had went all the way through. And uh, on 9-12 of last year, that trailer was rejected. Well, we picked up a load of bark in Gillette, Wyoming, and all the other loads we did not have any problems with until we got to a food um, production facility and they found that bark in that e-track took my driver an hour and a half with a leaf weed blower to blow that bark out of there but that was the pile of bark that came out of that trailer um, embarrassing yes but that's what we're up against next slide Um, going away from the customer side or customer service side, the planners uh, really need to pay pay attention more to what what is coming into them as far as um, you know not only what they're loading out but what's coming in. If um, you know they're going to be picking up produce, they want to know what the driver if, if he's experienced, if he's new or not. Um, there's education that needs to be known for uh, hauling produce. You've got your gas produces, uh, your berries and stuff like that that may be in a bag, how to pulp them. You also need to let your drivers know what to expect as far as the load times. Um, you know, you get your trailers pre-cooled, you got them washed up, you got them pre-cooled, you're at the loading site, and um, now you've got 15 hours on a live keel chicken facility. If your driver's going to be bored, he's going to be calling every five minutes. What do you, you know? You got to keep him patient. Keep the, make sure the equipment's ready to go once it's loaded. Um, what I always expect people to do is uh, first thing to do is defrost that the uh, reefer unit. So that uh, you get that condensation off of the off of the uh, compressors, and uh, you know, so you're going to be in a high temperature, high high humidity situation usually when you're loading, and you got to get that that uh, off the compressor so your units are working right. 
know, when you get into your nighttime delivery locations, you know, you show up with a load of, load of chickens, you get a 9 p.m. appointment, and, uh, you know, that guy gets empty at 11 o'clock at night, the planter's got to be ready to know that he's got to get that trailer washed out. That's not going to happen at midnight. Um, what we tell our drivers is keep that unit cold, keep it frozen after empty so you don't have that blood and stuff drying up or warming up um, when it's when it's uh, when you're in <laughs> sorry I lost my train of thought also with the planners um, we want them to monitor the uh, uh, drop yards. Make sure we're watching the temperatures on that, and I'll show you here later how we do that. Let's go to the next slide. Yep. Um, dispatch. We want them to communicate with the drivers. Again, make sure they're getting pre-cooled. Make sure they understand what's what they're loading and how it's to be loaded. Uh, to look for any type of damages on the on the product. Notify us of any delays in loading times, and um, uh, you know, notify the the planners of any other type of delays as well. Hold on. Sorry, my screen just went to sleep. Um, as the drivers are get, getting the stuff loaded, we need to monitor and make sure that everything is uh, secured, uh, especially with the um, Hey, uh, hello everybody. So, hey Kevin, are, are you still on the line or did we lose Kevin? Uh, John, are you still there? I am, yes. Okay. Well, we might be having, Kevin might be having a little bit of some technical difficulties. Do we want to jump into a question or two? Yeah, so let, let's just jump into some questions, John. So if you could just, uh, this is one that's just come through, um, and you touched on this, but if you could just clarify again for us, who needs to comply with uh, the FISMA um, regulations? So who specifically needs to, to comply? So looking at everybody that's, that's involved, shippers, carriers, loaders, receivers, what Overall, what FDA ended up doing is putting this substantial liability onto the shippers. And the reason they ended up doing this is because they believe, and rightly so, the shipper understands the product the best. Those that are shipping the product, they're the ones that understand the product the best. They're the ones that need to uh, set out the requirements for the receiver to, or the, excuse me, the carrier to follow. Now, so of course the shipper and the receiver are in play. Now with the addition of a broker, and this not only comes in uh, to play with domestic uh, brokering of loads from shippers to carriers, but also on the, uh, on the import side. So even though this is domestic ground transportation, if you've got product imported, the, you've got a, a, a foreign supplier who actually has to follow the rules, then you've got a little bit of a blackout area whether it's being shipped on barge or plane. And then when it gets to the port side, uh, usually uh, you know, you're not going to see the records come back online until that hits either a rail car or a truck. And so we've had some concern out there of how do we know that that foreign shipper is properly cleaning, sanitizing the product. And I'm going a little bit outside of the question, but I want to make sure to wrap in all the people that are included. But that U.S. broker is the one that's really going to understand 
from an, an, an import shipping point of what that foreign supplier has done with the product. And so that's really another big piece of why they included that broker, because he is the one that is brokering the loads between the international uh, uh, customer and then wherever it's going to end up domestically. And so that was the big inclusion with the shipper, but you get down to the carrier, and then of course the loader again is a big thing because sometimes you're not going to go from point A load, go to point B and unload. Sometimes there's going to be several spots, especially if you get into a food truck that's making 10, 12 stops around town as well. That person loading has to, they don't have to have a sheet and write everything down as far as is it clean, is the refrigeration unit properly. All they have to do is take a visual check and look at that stuff. And so, and then you get to the receiving end, the last component, and the receiver, it's their job to check and make sure that the product is good. And if there's been no problems whatsoever, usually the receiver will take it, product's fine, off they go. If there's been some sort of fluctuation within the temperatures, then that uh, receiver will then take a look at the product, either find a qualified individual or if they are a qualified individual, figure out if that product is still good. If the product is still safe, they accept it, they go on with their business. If it's still safe but the quality's not there, the lettuce has browned a little bit and it won't work on the grocery floor, then they may send that to a secondary market or else again they can uh, figure out if it, it is indeed unsafe and then reject the load. And so those are your main components, shipper, broker, receiver, loader, and carrier, and that's kind of how everybody works together. Okay, great. Hey. Um, and Kevin, are you back online? Uh, yep, I, I did have a technical <laughs> problem there, and I, I lost it every, lost everything. I had to re-sign it, but apologize for oh, that, everybody. Good. Oh, those acronyms. You, you were talking about those acronyms getting you, so that's what happened. <laughs> yep. So, um, you know, just kind of pick up where I was with as far as the um, uh, uh, dis dispatchers, as far as working with the with the drivers and, and planners. I mean, it's it's in, it's important that everyone's working together on that stuff. Um, uh, you know, if you get a delay on unloading times with the wash. Uh, you know, you got to figure in, in the, them washout times before his reloads. Uh, planners always have a tendency to try and push everything. Um, you know, he's empty at nine o'clock tonight, so he can he can load it eight o'clock in the morning. And you know, dispatch has got to remind that planner that uh, they need to to have the time to to make sure that equipment's clean and ready for the next load. And that kind of goes back to the nighttime deliveries, which um, become big in in our industry, which I'm not a big fan of just because all the S and D stays on your trailer for an extra day, day waiting for a buyer to tell you what to do with it. Um, so anyway, um, on that next slide, Ronnie. Um, as far as driver education, uh, you know, this this is where a lot of it's going to have to be. I mean, the drivers are the are the they're the guy that, that sees the product. They're the guy that uh, needs to inform operations as to you know what we're dealing with. Uh, it's easy to book a load, but uh, if we can't get it on the trailer and uh, uh, it's it's ready to to ship securely and and we can get it there without incident, um, the driver is the one that's going to tell us of the problems. Um, you know, we educate our drivers, of course, through our orientation program, and we uh, we use a continuing education web-based program, uh, Infinity, which uh, the drivers sign into every every week. They have a different lesson on on every acronym there is, and and there's some with FISMA in there, and um, uh, there's a test after each each session, so they can. Uh, uh, you know, click on that, and it kind of gives us a, a record that the driver had been educated. You know, as far as some changes in laws or or what's coming down the pipe, and uh, we also use this just to get the drivers uh, uh, new information. You know, with 
um, newsletters, stuff like that. We'll email it to the drivers. Uh, it's not easy to always get them in the office to, to tell them about new things. Um, you know, we, of course, make sure they know how to do their pre-trip inspections, with, uh, including the reefer units. Uh, reefer units today aren't the same as they used to be, uh, which is a good thing because these smart units now are a lot nicer. They uh, they run the pre-trips themselves. Uh, the equipment we run, we've got uh, door switches, so as soon as the doors open, the unit will turn off, which, uh, uh, you know, a lot of shippers will ask you to keep your unit running while you're loading, and all that's doing is pulling in humidity into your into your trailer and just causing all kinds of problems with the units. Um, you know, kind of everything else pretty much self-explanatory if you're in the transportation business as far as your pre-trip with your trailer conditions and, and uh, with the air chutes and your door seals, making sure they're all in good shape. Um, when the driver's on the dock, you know, take the ask, well, if he's allowed on the dock, we ask him to inspect the product prior to loading, uh, looking at the pallet conditions. Um, if they're able to, pull the, temp the temperature of the product. Of course, you want that within plus or minus to five degrees. Um, also, I have something to look for extra condensation on the on the uh, pallets. If a pallet comes out on the out of a freezer dock onto a warm dock, uh, you'll get the condensation in the plastic. You can kind of see that it's been sitting there for a while. Um, also, if you got heavy ice build up on there, you know, it could be a telltale sign that it sat on a warm dock prior to going into the freezer. Uh, so you can just kind of be a, want to be aware of that and make note of it on your bills when you take possession of the product. Um, if they're pre-cooled and backed in, ready to load or unload and they're not being worked on in, in a uh, reasonable amount of time, we ask them for, their, for the drivers to get with dispatch so that we can make the appropriate calls. Um, you know, because we're reliable until, until that bill's signed and if you're in the dock for five hours, you know, your temperatures are, are changing, you've got humidity buildup and everything else. Uh, the drivers, of course, you know, you'd think reefer fuel would be a, a given, but just remind them if their reefer fuel levels and additives during the winter. And, um, you know, the, the scales, um, everyone's got that driver that gets loaded and they go 200 miles down the street before they uh, go to scale and next thing you know you're overweight and you got a problem. Uh, you know, we ask them to get scales as quick as they can so if there is a problem we can get it back so we're not having uh, uh, condition problems with, uh, with, the, with the commodities. Um, you know, as far as an industry, as far as drivers, everyone knows what, what we're up against with that and who knows what the future is going to be with autonomous trucks and Uber and you know, Amazon's looking to go into the grocery business. That ought to be kind of interesting. Anyway, next, uh, next slide. Once we get into, uh, you know, uh, if all them other things between uh, customer service planning and dispatch down to the driver all work as the driver's doing uh, doing his computer work. Um, everything that we do here at Sharp, we uh, integrate into our TMS systems. Um, when we can't put in an order or put in a commodity code, as soon as uh, we build that order and we put that commodity code of in this instance, cheese, it automatically puts the temperature range between 34 to 38. And we set this by the uh, uh, customer master. So a different customer may have a, a tighter constriction than others. Uh, in this case, it's 34 to 38. Uh, next slide. Um, once our uh, system starts generating the information, this is an actual order um, on this. This is the, uh, the cheese load that we just seen. Um, once the driver sent in his loaded call at 1132, our TMS system stamp that, that it is loaded. And at that point, we officially have taken possession of that product. And um, we're monitoring that temperature. 
uh, every five minutes or so um, with, with that uh, return to error reading, and that's automatically generated. We don't have to do anything else. And this is, um, you know, it, uh, this is on our FL14 Spirion units that we have on our uh, on our reefer units. Next slide. Now I can double click on that return error, and it'll graph this thing out. And it's going to do this until that truck sends in its empty calls. So you know, at a, at a glance, I can look at it and I can say, you know, that thing's running right right down the middle where where it needs to be. So I'm pretty comfortable that uh, I'm taking care of the customer's product and doing our due diligence as far as uh, uh, making sure we're doing our part along the supply chain. Um, next slide. <coughs> Beyond uh, you know, what we're doing on, on the operational side, uh, when we have our equipment coming in, um, besides the um, daily vehicle inspections that uh, are required for the DOT, um, we also have an equipment service request module. So anytime a driver sees a problem with a trailer, it could be a wall damage, it could be a chute repair needs to be done, it could be uh, a hole, a leak, something in floor. Um, the driver sends in what we call an equipment service request and uh, this goes into our shop maintenance program so that uh, when that trailer comes back in we've got a record of what needs to be done as far as a uh, chute being rehung, uh, anything else. Uh, we also will once a drive-in or a trailer comes into the yard, we'll put a mechanic up inside the trailer and close the doors. It sounds like inhumane treatment, but uh, that's the only way you're going to see if you got daylight coming in anywhere. Uh, we've got uh, batch trailers that leak from the floor, and we've got a batch of trailers that leak from the uh, from the roof, and these are just manufactured defects. You're not going to find that until you have a rainstorm or You've got, you've got a problem with a shipper. Um, it's easier to fix it while it's in the shop than show up to a shipper to find out you've got a hole in, in the roof. Um, on our reefer units, we go through a maintenance program through our uh, through the manufacturer and uh, gives us a 24-hour breakdown service. Uh, the driver have an alarm code if they have any pro type of problem with the units. They just call a toll-free number. Um, They'll t go walking through to see if they can clear the codes. If they can't clear, clear the codes, they'll give them the nearest authorized repair shop, and uh, you know, kind of gives us peace of mind knowing that uh, uh, you know our units are running at, at the top specs that they can, and uh, you know we've got the uh, we use carrier units, so carrier goes around to all of our drop customer drop locations here in the state of Utah and uh, they perform PMs on all of our reefer units to make sure that we have uh, so that we have um, um, a record of the last time that trailer had had any or reefer unit had had any type of work and we know it's done by uh, experienced personnel um, so anyway I guess at the end of the day, you know, with with FISMA, you know, the old saying in, in trucking was, if a truck brought, uh, if you got it, a truck brought it. Um, well, I want to make sure that I didn't bring anything that's going to make you or your family sick. So, you know, these are just some of the things that we try and do as a corporate, as a company, to help our customers and our and our society. Back to you, Ronnie. Okay, Kevin, thank you so much. I mean, you can never underestimate the complexity of the, the industry that we serve. It's, um, so we certainly appreciate um, all that uh, SHARP does to, to keep everything safe that they, um, that they transport. So we've got a lot of questions. So, um, But first, I wanted to go back to John to, 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 to reiterate one point. I think what really critical um, is the whole notion of record keeping and the, the fact that, you know, exactly what, what are we looking for in terms of record keeping. It sounded to me like it wasn't like for every single load, but 
John, could you just talk a little bit more about that, just to, to make sure everybody is clear on that? Sure. I, first, I want to say, uh, Kevin, it's great to hear from an industry uh, and, and how everybody's doing things. If you guys aren't uh, fully meeting the full requirements of the STF, then I think you've got to be awfully close. Um, on the record keeping side, yeah, we touched on that a little bit as far as it being kind of the processes and the procedures that are in place. Uh, but it's, and, and this, the kind of the theme of the entire discussion that we've been having with industry is there's a lot of vagueness in the rule. There's a lot of ambiguity. Start talking to your shipper customers, figure out if you're on the same page or not, and if you aren't, kind of let them know what you're doing. And one of the examples of a potential pitfall is if you are a carrier and you're working with 10 different shipper customers and they have 10 different requirements because there is that much flexibility in here on how you need to haul each specific product, then you're going to have a logistical nightmare both in just contractual agreements as well as record keeping because everything's going to be different. Um, what we found is there has uh, begun to be quite a bit more technology uh, adoption just because uh, you're able to uh, more effectively and more efficiently project to the shipper this is the process that I have in place. And not only is that saleable to the shipper, these are my processes and procedures for uh, everything I do with my trailers and equipment from sanitizing and cleaning to being able to uh, download and send uh, uh, records uh, whether that's temperature or that's, that's uh, other, other record keeping, if you're able to do that at a, hit of a, a switch of a button as opposed to going to a third party, downloading your records and having to submit those, then it's, been a, a, it's minimized a lot of headaches. And so even though the record keeping stage on its face is not that arduous, it's being able to keep those records as far as the procedures, straight between all the different contracts you have. And so it's still a gray area as far as how everybody is going to disseminate the information and send the information and what's going to be required of FDA. And so we'll kind of see that work itself out over the next couple months. But at the end of the day, you're not going to have to have paper copies of every single load which is positive, but you are going to have to make sure that you're on the same page with everybody else as, as you continue your contract negotiations. Okay, that's great. That's, that's really helpful. That was a, a good clarification. And another question that kind of follows that that came in um, is, are, are door sensors required on um, trailers to, to, to make you compliant? So, you know, a door sensor would you know, be tied to a telematics device that would give an alert when the door opens or closes. So is, is that a requirement? I think in, pre in, in Kevin's presentation, he had, did a good job of um, showing the flaws of the communication and understanding of the shipper with the actual transportation unit. Uh, when he was talking about trying to keep the refrigeration unit on while the door is open, actually has a, a, a negative adverse effect. And the same thing goes with uh, the cleaning of trailers. What the shipper is using on their manufacturer floor is probably not going to be the same thing that works inside of uh, your, your, your steel trailer floor. And so um, now I, I lost my train of thought a little bit here. Kevin, it's, it's, uh, it, it, you're having an impact on me. It's, it's um, contagious. <laughs> 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 yeah, we were just we were talking about whether, whether uh, yeah, Kevin does use uh, yes, um, yeah. door, okay. door sensors. Te yeah. Technology. So now now my roundabout uh, too much explanation is getting me confusing myself. Um, so there, it, within the rule, there's no specific technology requirements. All of that is left up to the shipper. So as far as uh, door sensors, as far as the, the kick on and off sensor that Kevin had alluded to, as far as the difference between tail temping, just ambient air temp in the trailer, or actually having the top of the line telematics where it's recording everything, all of that stuff is going to be left up to the shipping uh, uh, 
the shipping customer, and then it's going to be the, the carrier's job to follow that. But within FDA's uh, actual requirements, they don't even require everything to be electronic. You can still have paper records. You just have to be able to show uh, that you can produce those if necessary, but there's no actual specific technology requirements. Got it. Got it. Okay. And and, and then, Kevin, if, um, if I just um, push over to you for a sec, um, you do, I just wanted to confirm that you do use door sensors on your reefers. Do you use door sensors on your dry vans as well? Uh, no, I mean there's there's really no no need on a dry van. I mean you're at that point you're looking at load securement and, and uh, custody uh, chain of custody, uh, mm -hmm. which you can which you do with the seal and stuff like that. Uh, your door your door sensors basically uh, if your unit is running, um, you know you're you're running at minus ten. You open up the doors, it'll automatically turn the reefer unit off, so you're not pulling in that hot humid air in, into the box, which uh, mm -hmm. you know, it just causes more problems than, than uh, uh, for, for you as a carrier and, and the integrity of the product as well. Um, uh, so what, what, you know, what will happen is on an older, older trailer, you know, and we still have some in our fleet, um, uh, reefer units run and you open up the doors, you're, you're in uh, uh, Barstow, California, it's 105. You know, you're just pulling. All you're doing is you're going to pull that heat right into the trailer um, with the unit off. Um, you, you have a cold, cold air and, and a warm air. It's it's basically basic physics as far as you know. Your cold air wants to get warm, and your warm air wants to get cold. So um, yeah, you just don't want to have that that pull of that warm, moist air in, into your into your reefer box, even cooling down for the last two hours. So, you know, the sensors just turn that turn the unit off itself. Got it. Okay. Oh, well, that's great. Um, now, Ke uh, Kevin, do you um, do you have all company drivers, or do you also use owner operators? Uh, we're we're about uh, ninety eight percent company drivers. We do have a handful of owner owner operators, but um, you know, they're they're in the same uh, genre as our as our. Um, um, company drivers as far as, you know, we send them the same uh, educational information as everyone else because, you know, whether you're an owner operator and they're the ones that have to protect themselves as well as protect our, uh, us, uh, us as a company as well. Okay, so do you, in, so, um, you include them in your uh, all your training programs and provide them that mm -hmm. information, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, we, don't, we don't mandate that they take the, uh, the test. I mean, they have to take the test at the end of the webinar type thing, but it's not it's not used as a, you know, there, we can't use that as a, a bonus feature or anything else. Um, you know, quite, we kind of use that educational as a, as a bonus towards their bonus, uh, safety bonus program. Um, but as an owner operator, of course, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, um, so you've got a combo of, of both dry vans and, and refrigerated um, units and you use um, Sperian systems on on both of those. Um, how does the the tracking, the trailer tracking, differ for the the dry vans from the from the refrigerated trailers? Well, I mean, the, both systems were can't, are are pretty much the same um, on our TMS set screens. Uh, dispatch and planners can can look and see, you know, the truck location, trailer location. You can. If if uh, if they have the wrong trailer in the system um, dispatched, you can see that the truck's going one dire direction. The trailer's staying in in one place, so you know he's got the wrong trailer. The dispatch didn't integrate through. Um, but it's all uh, all of that stuff is tracked through our TMS system, and it, it integrates in uh, the refrigerated units, uh, which is the FL14s. Or just a basic system. I mean, they just tell you that the return air temp, which uh, I showed on the on the slide. Um, there's other systems out there, and and uh, you know that you can actually do a full download from your computer screen. You can turn the reefer units on and off, and I do have them on a, a couple of my carrier units that we've been kind of playing around with. But uh, return on investment on that versus uh, you know 
practicalities for, for our size of fleet. It's really not, you know, what we're doing at the FL14s works for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let me, um, let me toss it back over to, um, to John. So this question just came in. Has FISMA changed traceability requirements? It has. Um, I think it's just kind of solidified what was already there. And again, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, FISMA uh, is really focused on the manufacturing, the processing of the food. But in order to really get the full traceability of the product, you've got to follow it from its inception in the field until uh, the, the end consumer point. And so there hasn't really been, at least in the food industry, a full and complete traceability in place as far as food safety requirements go. And so I think what FISMA did is mandate FDA to make sure, uh, you know, and there is traceability when you get into uh, some of your, your, uh, your meat products, but as far as just food as a whole, it gave uh, uh, FDA the opportunity to really go in and tie all the facets of the, of the, the supply chain together to make sure that if there is a problem at this stage in the process, then they can go backtrack and figure out exactly where uh, that came from. And that was made evident in a recent example uh, in Georgia where somebody had a cookie and for some reason they decided to go test that cookie that they got uh, and found that the non-peanut cookie actually had traces of peanut in it. And so they went back to the bakery, who went back to then to the flour mill and found that there was, I believe, since I'm in the trucking industry, there was a rail hopper. Um, but I no, I'm, I, I think uh, you know it was actually a, a rail car that had some uh, a little bit of trace of peanut dust in it, and then was filled with flour, which then went to the bakery, and so on and so forth. And so it gave them that opportunity to go back and figure out where that came from, so they could stop that. And not only is FISMA good about going back and tracing where the contaminant came from, a lot of the rule is focused on preventative measures. And so figuring out how to actually be proactive as opposed to reactive. And so that's one of the beefier pieces of FISMA is the preventative controls piece that actually goes in and says, how can we actually prevent this from even happening in the first place? Excellent. And I'm just going to toss one last question to you before we, we close, because um, I've gotten two questions about this. Um, must produce be shipped in refrigerated trucks? That seems like a broad question, but I'll toss that out to both of you. Kevin may be able to, to let you know on the more practical side, but uh, for us, unless that produce, which there's not many that come to mind, that are temperature controlled for safety, then they must be refrigerated. But if it's a temperature control for quality thing, ultimately they do not have to, uh, uh, under the rules, they do not have to be uh, temperature controlled. But I'll, I'll let, I don't know if Kevin hauls any produce, but I'll let him answer that from a practical standpoint. I mean, as, as far as uh, just general consensus, I mean, your melons, a lot of your melons will, will come in, or, are not required to be refrigerated. Uh, watermelon, a lot of your cantaloupes, well, cantaloupes they usually want to have, have refrigerated, but uh, um, your melons, they'll, they'll load them on a flatbed with in combo bins. So, but uh, yeah, 98% of your produce you, you've got to have refrigerated. Uh, and most, most of it is just for quality, I think. Um, but, uh, uh, about the All right. Well, I think of that don't need need to be refrigerated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, listen, um, John and and Kevin, we certainly appreciate you joining us today for this for this um, webinar. And um, if we didn't, for all the attendees, if we did not get to your question, we will follow up with you and get your question answered, and we'll send you an email. Um, you will be getting a follow-up email, and we'll love for you to take a, a short survey about how your 
your fleet is compl uh, complying with regulations and what regulations mean to you. Uh, we're going to be providing a, um, the survey results back out to the entire industry. And we'll be sending out an invitation for our next webinar in our educational series um, in June. So we look forward to seeing you all then. Again, thank you, everybody, for joining us.